It's a great joy as an Irishman to be here in Derry. It's a famous history and it's a, it's a privilege to be able to speak in this city. Uh, I want to begin with a, an overview of um, my own testimony, how I became a Roman Catholic priest and I was a Catholic priest, a devout Catholic priest for 22 years and uh, how I came to be a Catholic priest. I grew up in Dublin and uh, my family was devout Catholic. My earliest memories are four-year-old in the living room of our house in Dublin, praying the rosary, praying to Mary every single evening. We never missed praying the rosary and it was a, it was a very big part of our life. And we would pray the 50 Hail Marys and then we would um, afterwards pray, Hail Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, Hail our life, our sweetness and our hope. Our life was built around Mary and we prayed mostly to Mary. It was the days before personal prayer came along. It wasn't to come along till the 1970s when the charismatic movement began in the, began in the Catholic Church. So in those days we only prayed what you call rote prayers, prayers that we had memorized, and especially the Hail Mary, where we address Mary as uh, the one who would, our, was our help, and the one who would bring us comfort. So it was, Mary was the center of our prayers. If somebody was sick, you said three Hail Marys. It was like the formula was always praying to Mary. So that was my earliest memories, was praying to Mary in the, in the rosary. And then I went to study with the Jesuits from primary school and, and uh, secondary school. So the Jesuits had me from all my education. And when I was seven years old, I could defend why we as Catholics had a living voice. We had an infallible Pope and we didn't have a dead book. <laughs> that was some of the sort of things we said, you know, because we had an infallible Pope and our our whole faith was in, in the Catholic Church as such. So it was um, a very sincere, but it didn't bring you anywhere because we also pray to the saints, you know, we have Saint, Saint Jude, if something was lost, Saint Dimphna, if you're emotional upset, you pray to Saint Dimphna, and uh, young ladies would pray to Saint Anne, the prayer was Saint Anne, Saint Anne, bring me a man, you know, that's, that's, well, that's how we would joke about it, but they would pray more intently to, to, um, to Saint Anne. So we the saints for everything, and it was, it was mix something, and it was, it didn't really get anywhere, but that was our tradition. And uh, then I, <clears throat> when I was young, I was high flying in social life. I was a good tennis player, and uh, I loved to. We had dances at the tennis club every Saturday. Oh man, I used to love those gals. And here am I as a young boy, and so which one will I marry? And maybe that gal there, you know. And, and uh, I was really enjoying life and uh, I had my mind made up I was going to become a dentist so I'd get a good living and I was going to get married and I had my eye on one particular girl eventually and then something happened. Pope Pius XII, he was a very severe looking Pope during the war years and he came out with a encyclical, that's a letter to the whole church, and of course as Catholics we were meant to study what he said. I not only studied what he said, I memorized what I thought was most significant, and to this day I know it by heart. These are his exact words of what he wrote way back then. Great mystery this and source of unending contemplation that the salvation of many should depend on the prayers and sacrifices of the members of the mystical body of Christ offered for this intention. The salvation of souls by prayer and sacrifice of Catholic people. That was the message and I took it very seriously. And so seriously I said, I'm not going to get married. I'm going to dedicate myself to the church. I'm going to sacrifice the joys of being married. I'm going to become 
a Catholic priest. So this was my motivation because the Pope said prayer and sacrifice was the way that brought salvation. At least bring people to go to purgatory and then to heaven afterwards. But that was that was the way for salvation. And uh, I went into the Dominican Order. I went. We were finally to do eight years. First year was the devotional year, and then afterwards in County Cork along the Lee River, uh, we had a. I had studies there in the Dominican Priory for two years. I had bought a Bible as a young man. Three pounds was a fortune from here to back in those. I thought we were going to study the Bible, you know. First year was all devotionals, mostly to do with Mary, the way of the cross, mystical prayer, which is a big part of Catholicism, and on and on, just devotionals and religious readings, and it was lives of saints, and you know, just on and on. And then we started to study philosophy, the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas, not Thomas, Thomas Aquinas based himself on Aristotle. Aristotle, a pagan before 300 years before Christ came into the world. I have a book of 50 former priests, far from Rome, near to God, the testimonies of 50 former priests. It's the same with every one of those. Every single one, you studied philosophy at least for two years. I did it three years. Every single priest must study the the philosophy of, of, of Greece through learning Aristotle. And uh, they needed to prove some things in their theology. They needed some of the physics and metaphysics of Aristotle to prove some of their things to do with the sacraments. So that was actually, we found out the reason later. So we didn't study the Bible. It was philosophy. I, I sometimes joking with my wife if she does something and I will quote Aristotle to her. <laughs> I say, in gustibus non est disputandum. You know, that's uh, in, in taste there's no dispute. I know a whole lot of, of the sayings of uh, Aristotle. I know them in Latin because we studied it in Latin. Uh, so, you know, and she's not highly impressed when I quote, <laughs> when I quote Aristotle's philosophy to her. But uh, we did. We learned it and I, I memorize it like people would memorize scripture. I still know a lot of it and it uh, doesn't get you anywhere but at least you know it shows when you memorize something as, as a young person sometimes you remember it all through your life. And so it was difficult but then we, I was sent to Tala in Dublin just outside Dublin and we were to study theology for four years. Again it wasn't the Bible we studied um, Th Thomas Aquinas, who was based on Aristotle, church councils, decrees of the church, and he was, he was one who could, from uh, many different sources, try to teach us, and we, particularly we major too on him teaching about the sacraments. Like when a baby is baptized, you know, and, uh, and uh, you pour water over the head, that the power of the words and the pouring of the water, um, new life is given. That's one of the ones that they use Aristotle, that a physical thing can give spiritual life. You need to prove that by Aristotle. But uh, that's the things we were learning. And it was, uh, we studied intently Thomas Aquinas. We did some stuff about the Bible. We learned about the Bible, but it was from German scholars like um, uh, um, Boot, Bootman was it, and some of the others, I can't remember to say all the names now, but this was to disprove the genuineness of Scripture, that they really copied, and they didn't have, they weren't genuine manuscripts, they were reading St. John, it wasn't really John, it was how people tried to put together what they, they think John would have said, and on and on, just damnable lies based on German philosophy, which historically hadn't got a leg to stand on. So, but that was what we were taught. So we learned to distrust the Bible because of form criticism, redaction criticism, and higher criticism, that they were the three uh, names for that horrific system which we studied intently. So 
I was more put off reading the Bible, you know, because, and this is the reason why we have Mother Church and we have an infallible Pope. So I went on studying and I was uh, quite devout and quite intent. When I was a student a few years, I learned what Mary was supposed to have said at Fatima, you know, the apparitions of Mary. Mary is supposed to say many souls go to hell because there's nobody to pray or do penance for them. This was like the Pope said, but much more explicit. Souls go to hell because there's nobody to suffer for them or do penance. So I decided to do, to do more penance. The living in a monastic setting was very rigorous anyway, but I was going to do more penance. And you know how cold it gets in Ireland in the winter? We had showers, and I would go in as I got up in the morning and just turn on the cold tap fully and go in and stand under that until my bones would not nearly shake with, with pain. It was one of the more horrific penances I've ever done. And, and I couldn't bear it anymore. I'd get out of the shower. And then later on, I would start walking with little pebbles in my shoes to feel pain when I walked. And then after some months, I would, I, I, I made a little whip. I got permission from the, the priest who was in charge of us students to make a little whip, take off my white gown, my Dominican gown, and my undershirt, and whip myself, what they call flagellation. In the lives of the saints that I read, some people had whipped themselves to blood. I never came near blood, just till I couldn't bear it any longer. But this is how devout I was. You will see in this book of 50 former priests, other priests doing things like that. It was a Catholic teaching, not just like the Pope said it and the, and the apparitions, that, you know, when you suffer, you can help redeem people so that they would come to salvation. Of course, that is utterly blasphemous. If you know the gospel, it's Christ when he had by himself purged of sins. Christ alone sacrifices acceptable to God. And any human addition to it is, is, is an insult to Christ Jesus. But we didn't understand that. So it's really sad to see other priests like myself doing things like this. But um, we, we went on, and I, I did really well in studies, and I, I was sent to the Angelicum University to do, to do nine months and to get two um, degrees in theology. So I was sent to Rome. That was for the extra special students who did well in their examination. So I was off to Rome, 1964, having been ordained in 63. And I was aghast. When I reached Rome, we had called Rome the holy city. The first night when you came off the train and we were coming to walk towards the Colosseum and a little bit up towards the Colosseum was San Clemente, the church, and the, the Dominican house, San Clemente. The prostitutes on the street were, were quite evident. And it was, I never saw anything like this in Dublin. And I said, this is supposed to be the holy city. It was worse when the classes began at the college. There was 300 in the class. And um, I found after a few weeks, because everybody spoke English for the most part, even though from all countries of different the world, Latin was the language that the class was in. Of course, we all were fluent at Latin. And uh, it was, it was, really a distress to me because it was about six of the 300 were like myself trying to be holy and good priests. And the others couldn't care less. They were there to get a degree and get a high position and get a well salary job somewhere, you know, because they were, had the degrees in the Catholic Church. And uh, then the immoral language and uh, what was evident that these men are highly immoral, immoral. And I just stopped associating or talking to some of these because I was scandalized to see this is the holy city 
And this is supposed to be the cream of the crop. You know, this is the, the best priests, you know, from over the world, have qualified to come here to the best university in the world. The Jesuits said they had the best. We said, the Dominicans, we had the best, but one of the best universities. And it, it was just horrible. And I couldn't take it. I literally couldn't stomach it. it was, I was getting sick. I got permission to go up to Fiesole near Florence for two weeks rest, and then I came back and I tried again. And then the the man who was looking after my thesis to write, he asked me how is my thesis coming along for my degree, and I said I'm not going to do any thesis. I'm not going to do either degree. He said, "What? This is why you came here to Rome?" I said, "I can't stand it." I've got, I've got to get early exams and get out of here. He said, you must do it. And he talked to some other leading men, professors, and they talked to me, and I said, no. And then the first man came back and he said, well, he said, if you're having problem writing your thesis, he said, I have a good thesis here that was written some years ago by a man, and I'll give you that and just change it around a bit and put your name on it. I said to him, I can't do that. That's immoral. I said, just look at Caracara Park and you see the prostitutes parading their goods. That's immoral. This is immoral, what you're saying. And he did not like being reprimanded by a young priest, this, this professor. I said, that's immoral. You can't, I could not do that. And I'm not going to do any degree. I'm going to get early exams and go home to Ireland, back to Dominican Priory and Tala, and uh, they were very furious, and I reached back Ireland. Uh, oh man, the superior was really annoyed, and he he uh, talked to some other of the main men in charge of the order, and I was got a, a assignation. That's a, an assignment where I was told I had to go to Trinidad, West Indies. Uh, that is just about ten degrees away from the equator. Uh, extremely hot and humid and really strange. When I came down on the tarmac, 64, uh, temperature is like going into an oven <laughs> when they open the door and you come down the step. And then the, uh, from the first night, the mosquitoes, not mosquitoes, but and other insects. It must be about four or five thousand insects all come alive just around six before it gets dark. Uh, it's, you can't sleep at night with the noise of the insects. And it wasn't, uh, uh, so, I mean, some of them, like the mosquitoes, are troublesome too, but it's a noise. And uh, uh, it was really, really strange. And then the snakes, you know, that was, <laughs> you talk about snakes in the grass. You had to have your grass cut because you literally have snakes in the grass. And then when the, you know, when you came to, uh, you, you parked your car, you, you finally got home or someplace, you, 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 you got a, 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 you know, a, a torch and you looked underneath to see was there any snakes in the chassis. You know, because if they were, they could come down, and next time you come into the garage, you might be bitten by a coral snake or something. You know that. So it was, it was strange. It was strange, strange. And then, and I started hearing confessions. It was, and in those days, Catholics went much to confession. It wasn't just I sweat because of the tropics. The things I was hearing, it was. You're sitting in a confession box for about four hours on Saturday afternoon, then you have supper, and then you go back for another hour. It's, it's like sitting in a dumpster with garbage poured all over, you know. For, and it, it, it's worse because it's, 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 it's immoral filth into your ear. And uh, sometimes with the young women, you, they're right beside you because you only have a grill and you're looking right at their face. I would see the sweat on, the, on their cheeks as they told me some of the, uh, the sexual sins and everything, it, it was horrible, you know. And uh, I never thought it was going to be like that, you know. And, there was, and then as the years went by, the people came back with the same sins, and you wonder, we said it in Latin in those days, so it went later on into English, you know, I absolve you from all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And people come back two weeks later, and some of the people you could see, 
they were commit, confessing, committing adulteries for many times, and then you know they were going to come back next week with the same sin. They're still going to communion. You know what I mean? He said, "I mean, it. This is not like my Irish Catholicism. At least the Irish Catholics were, you know, trying to live the Catholic life. But these, it, it was just really strange, and uh, it was very hard to keep going. And." Uh, I did, and I baptized babies on road accidents, and they they know nothing about driving, and they know speed limits, and, and it was, there was full speed limits, but if the police stopped you, they were looking for a bribe, you know, something, so, uh, so that you could, you wouldn't give you a ticket, but it was a, it was strange island, and it was a, I just persevered, and I was, a, I was nine years a priest, and my life totally changed. I was visiting a home, instead of walking up 24 steps while they came down, tied up the Alsatian dogs, I did what I did when I visited that home before. I jumped a little fence three foot at the top of the hill, knock, was going to knock on the door, and somehow I slipped. I went down those 24 concrete steps on my back, and I damaged my back spine, <coughs> and the whole nervous system going up into the brain, and I was three days unconscious, and it, it's hard to explain, but there's like a subconscious consciousness when you're unconscious. Things I sort of recall, you don't know even how to get words for it, how, how painful it was to know that you just have to let go, and you're dead, and you're somehow trying to hold on, and this is all on in your unconscious mind, but it was, I was very aware when I was unconscious. I don't know how to explain it, but it was frightening. And when I came back to consciousness, I was in a mess because of the pain and a big turban around my head because of the, the wound in the head, and uh, Neuro, neurosurgeon examined me with x-rays and he said that I had really I done colossal damage uh, to my whole emotional system because the, the, the nervous system goes right up the back spine into the head into the brain it's all connected and he said I had uh, it was um, it would be about two it would be about two years before I was normal <laughs> again. <laughs> Not a nice report from a neurosurgeon, but at least I knew I was going to be normal <laughs> again. So it was, I was in a sanatorium there for about three months. And, uh, but in the time in the sanatorium, when I was really, really conscious of what had happened, I wondered if I died, where would I gone? I knew I was a sinner, I knew I did sacraments, but I knew I wasn't right with God, and if I had died, I would have gone to hell. And I was frightened, really frightened when you come so close to death. So I began studying the Bible. And the Lord had me read St. John's Gospel, and then the first letter of John, then Isaiah 53, because I knew that was something about why Christ was going to die, then prophecy, and then I started reading Paul's letters, and I got stuck, as it were, it was the grace of God. I got stuck in Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. I kept reading them sometimes 20 times a day. I'd read Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. And it started to, it was just utter revelation to me. It was, first of all, it, it, I had always taught Catholics, it's like, uh, you know, uh, salvation is in, in, the, in the human heart. You're justified at baptism. You're made inwardly just, and it's in, in you, in the human soul, in the human heart. I taught it to the children of Catechism. It was always salvation. It's like, you know, you, and then you get, you, get, you get sacramental grace through the sacraments, like going to, a, uh, to get your uh, petrol in your car, you know, you get filled up, and it's in you. And it was... That was the standard teaching I saw in Ephesians 1. Paul explains the gospel, and then he says, accept it in the beloved. And then he talks about redemption in Christ, in whom, in him. You know, all the different ways of explaining salvation. I got my, a red pen and went to my Catholic Bible. I underlined 42 times. 
in those two chapters, salvation is in Christ. Utter revelation to me. Then it was Paul's own testimony, Philippians, you know, that may be found in him not having my own righteousness. It was what John said, I went back to read John's Gospel, everlasting life, you know. He who has the Son has life. And when we're in the, in, he who does not have the Son does not have life. It's, it's, uh, everlasting life is in the Son. It's in Christ. And on and on, it was the same in Peter's uh, letter, the righteousness of God in Christ. It was all in Christ. And this was utter, utter contrast. And I went on studying and I studied grace, what grace was. I knew that as exact definitions of grace is the sacraments of the new covenant are necessary for salvation, still official Catholic teaching to this day. I knew that. And then we would name the seven sacraments. That's how you get grace. And uh, then I read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Well, by, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. Works was the word we used in our official declaration of what the sacraments were. We said that they worked ex opere operato, that is, they worked absolutely for certain. From the work, worked. That's the way you translate those Latin words, ex opere operato. And we define them as works. And the Bible says not of works. And this was causing my stomach now to be upset. And <laughs> it, see, this is my job. This is who I am. How can, how can I continue to search? And it was, it was difficult. And the climax came, actually, it was after some months I stopped and then went back to it again. It was faith. And the scripture was clear, Paul, to, in, in, to the jailkeeper, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The object was Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Peter said, we have obtained uh, a faith in, 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 uh, through, through righteousness. I forget the exact words, but Peter says the same thing. It's always grace is the gift of God. And the object is believing in Christ. And that became clear to me. It's interesting to see other priests come to the same conclusion in their testimonies in this book. But uh, there's hardly a testimony that, that those verses didn't impact Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And, and faith. I, I, I saw then, it, it, grace is what it says. And I came to study faith. Catholic Church is emphatic that we believe on the Church. It says the, 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 the Church is the mother of all believers. The, it, believing is an ecclesial act. The Church's faith precedes, engenders, and nourishes our faith. No one can have God as father who does not have the church as mother. It is the church that believes first and so bears and nourishes our faith. These are exact quotations. I knew exact Catholic teaching. We believe on the church. She is the one who gives us faith. And she is the one who instructs us and gives us the sacraments. And that was that was the clinch, and after that, I really desired to, I really desired to, to be what the scripture said. And I would sit in my chair, and I would say, like God in heaven, I, 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 I trust on Christ Jesus by faith and grace. And I want to be accepted in him, as it says in Ephesians, and have salvation. And I come back another evening, and again in my living room or something, again sitting in a chair, I'd, I'd say again, and nothing seemed to happen. And I was, 
I was in pieces because now, now I was drinking to, to steady my nerves. I was taking sometimes two beers and a little bit of rum to sleep at night. And, and when I would talk to other priests, they'd jeer me because who was I? You know, we studied all that back in seminary. Who, who you know, forget that, you know. And, and on the golf course to say, Bennett, you pray to your Jesus to get that ball down. You know, they would, they would mock me, you know. And, and so anyway, so here am I crying out to God now. I got on the floor and I knelt down and I said, God in heaven, show me. I've been studying this now for years now, since my accident. Show me what it is because I desire I desire to be right with you and have peace with you and have sins forgiven. And I'm no closer than when I started back in 1972. That's when the accident took place. And now we're in the 80s. And it's coming up to 84, 85. And then the Lord brought to me one verse. And I thank God for this. He brought to mind a verse I knew well, but I never applied it. He said, you being dead in trespass and sins, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And I prayed again on my knees, God, show me that I am spiritually dead. And if you dare pray that prayer, God shows you when you're not, when you're not saved, he shows you. He showed me I spiritually dead. I thought I'd been a good priest, not like some of these womanizer uh, uh, priests and all of these priests who, who you know overdo rum you know from 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 actually morning to night and you know the, all the the wickedness i knew in the lives of other priests and i'm a good priest i used to think and i now searching in the bible since my accident and i must have something going for me when god was saying spiritually dead and then i realize i'm spiritually dead and so another evening I got on the floor and I knelt down and I said, God in heaven, I'm spiritually dead. Give me the gift of faith. Give me the gift of faith and energize it and make it alive by the grace in which you empower it so that I would know salvation in Christ and have my sins forgiven and have peace with you. And then I knelt there for about five, ten minutes as the Spirit of God was coming over me and I put my hands to heaven. I said, Father in heaven, I thank you that I believe in Christ alone, trust him alone by the grace that he gives. My sins are forgiven. I have peace with you and I have everlasting life. I praise and I thank you, Father in heaven. For the gift of salvation and then I got down on the floor and I cried for about 15 minutes and it was then that any addiction I was beginning to get to drink was gone and then next Sunday I was telling people not to don't come to me for confession it says in first John if anyone sins God is faithful and just to forgive sins I was quoting I said don't come to me for and people were phoning the Archbishop and and the following Sunday I was trying to explain what happened to me to the people that maybe you should just look to God and ask him to show you that you really are spiritually dead and then look to him for pray to grace. I was trying to explain to them what had happened to me and that didn't go well and I was called to the Archbishop's house and when he heard the reports of what I preached and I was told I had to leave the parish and I was not going to I had a little while to get out but had to leave and I was never to never to I knew better I was never to preach like I had preached and so it was um, it was then that I cried out to God when I saw that I could not continue that he he'd give me a love for Catholics that I could give what I found to precious Catholic people and I cried out, and he, like, so you know you sense that God is assuring you that this will be. And by God's grace, I got to, I, I was able to leave Trinidad, go to Barbados, then to Canada. Canada come across with a Greyhound bus into the States, and uh, with two bags the rest of my life, and three hundred fifty dollars in traveler's checks. <laughs> but 
God has looked after me and by God's grace, now 27 years since all of this, I have a mission reaching out to Catholics in love and I do see precious Catholic people coming to others. And I do see evangelicals who I call evangelies, a lot of them there because they're not evangelical. They, you know, they, they're denying the graces, making it look like, you know, just come forward, sign the card, make your decision, you know, and we'll, we'll certify the Billy Graham type. If you go on the Billy Graham uh, uh, webpage or Campus Crusade, you know, all you got to do is this and this and this. And uh, Louis Perlau sort of thing, invite Christ into your heart. That message was to the was to Christians in Laodicea. It's not, it's not a gospel message, and you know, and, and all all these things. And I really get ministering to false evangelicals, and that's a great, a great, because there's nowhere for Catholics. You've got to warn them of what's out there. <laughs> they have to know a, a, a doctrines of grace church. They have to know where the gospel is truly preached. That's, the church that has put on this meeting tonight, you know, that, that, that's, they have to know that. So, so I thank God for that. So that's a little overview. Uh, have anybody any questions or uh, anything you want to ask? Because um, I really want to get into Patrick. <laughs> I was so, so encouraged when, when I became a believer then to discover that the fate of the Irish for 700 years after Patrick had preached the true gospel here, for 700 years was biblical and nothing like Catholic or anything with rituals in it. Nothing like it. Absolutely biblical. And that Patrick had written many things, a testimony, a letter to Karatikos, and you can get many little booklets like this uh, on, on his, his life story and his letter to Karatikos, translated from Latin. You can get it so easy on the internet. Uh, the testimony of Patrick and the letter to Karatikos, the two authentic manuscripts, and we're sure that they are authentic. You know, there's different places that have saved, you know, uh, copies of ancient records where we had them from. We're sure it's from the, it was written by Patrick himself. So I really want to get to that. But if there's any questions, we take the questions first. Yes? Can you hear young boys have healing from the priest report? A big one, what? Can young boys have I was 18 when I, when I went in. Yes, I was. A, and it, it's sad that that's the case in this book. You find most of the priests went in early. And, and they come out late, they usually come out in the 40s. It's really sad that when the Lord does wake up the men in this book, this is, a, I know more since this book was published in 1994, which is a third edition. Uh, I know many more priests who are saved, but it's sad that they, they come out later in life and they used to come out in the mid to late 40s or 50s. And it's so sad that when they get married afterwards that they, there's very few have children because they would get married too late, you know. But it, it's um, it's it's that is consistent. There was going in early, and usually uh, then having really coming to see the message of salvation later in life. Good question, but that's the way it was with me and with most of the priests in this book. So, uh, anything else? Or I'll go on to Patrick then. Um, 